All right. Good morning, everybody. It's so great to see all of you this morning. And as uh, everybody else has been saying, let me say it as well. A special welcome to all the men who are here today, to all the, the fathers, the, the husbands, the grandfathers this morning. We're glad you're with us. And we trust that this will be a day you'll sense God's grace and that you'll also sense the, the love and the support of this church family. I've always loved this uh, picture here of uh, my dad with uh, me and my brothers. It was actually a newspaper article. Uh, my father always wanted a daughter. He didn't get one. He had three sons that he raised, and uh, I think he did a pretty good job raising us. We loved him back with all of our hearts. Uh, I was uh, young, the bottom there, that's me and my kids there. I was a young 25 years of age when I first became a father. I clearly did not know what I was doing. Uh, the Lord gave us three kids, and by the grace of God, you know, they've all turned out to be productive, tax-paying, you know, responsible citizens of the United States. And uh, they, we, they all love Jesus, and they're all raising their kids to do the same thing. And we're very, very grateful as parents for that. My wife and I oftentimes reflect uh, about how much more challenging we think it is today to raise kids than when we were raising kids. We raised kids for the most part in the 80s and the 90s, a little bit into the 2000s. But you know, with the rise of the internet, social media, online communication, and so many other things, I think parents today have challenges guiding and protecting their children that no other generation has had before. And I oftentimes say when I have parents in front of me, you have my hashtag respect. And uh, you, we also, you also have our love. Today we're going to continue uh, something that we started on Mother's Day, a family chat series. We're going to actually continue it over the next four Sundays or so. We're going to talk about marriage and parenting and grandparenting and singleness and things like that. And this morning, I have the privilege of addressing specifically men who are here today, dads, granddads, husbands. And I've entitled my message today from Mark chapter 9, uh, a distraught dad. You might be here this morning as a dad and you're up against the wall. Uh, this guy was too. A distraught dad, a troubled child, and a mountain-moving faith. And so if you go with me to Mark chapter 9, I'd like to read the passage there in front of us, and we'll uh, see what God has uh, for our hearts this morning. Matthew 9, beginning at verse 17. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him under the ground. He foams at the mouth gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this from childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Don't you love those words, church? And when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. This is a fascinating passage of scripture, I think. 
It's found in three of the Gospels. Matthew's Gospel says that this episode actually happened at the foot of a mountain. And you might be here this morning feeling like you're trying to move a mountain today. This was a dad who I think was clearly at the end of his rope. Maybe the challenges of your life today have you at the same spot. He tried to get his disciples to handle this problem, but they clearly were at a loss as to what to do. This is a boy who is really a mess, and maybe you are dealing today with a messy situation. I really want you to see that the ultimate thing that changed this situation was when this father expressed what I want to call weak but mountain-moving faith there in verse 24, and he brought his son to Jesus Christ. And today I want to use this passage to really encourage all of us, men and women alike, but especially today, husbands, fathers, and grandfathers. The first piece of encouragement I want you to think about here in this passage, and then another one is this, that we have a high calling as husbands. We have a high calling as men, as fathers, as fathers-in-law and grandfathers, right? So this father decided that he was going to take care of business, and it was, he was, he was done with what was going on in the, in the life of his son, and I think we have that same calling, Paul said it this way in Ephesians chapter 3 in verse 14 and 15. He says, quote, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family on heaven and earth is named. I want you to think about those words because I believe the ultimate truth there is that that God the Father reaches out and gathers sinners like you and me to himself. That's the ultimate truth there. We have a father in heaven, and we're here today following him, clothed in our right mind, because he in his fatherhood reached out and brought us to himself. Is that amazing or what, church? But then Paul goes on to say there that from that idea, from that truth, every family on heaven and earth is named. Every family on heaven and earth has their beginning, has their genesis in this amazing idea. And and so God the Father shares the wonder of fatherhood. We are here today because he is our father, but he also shares the wonder of fatherhood with you and me as mere men. What an amazing, amazing truth that is. Men, we have a high and sacred calling. We have a holy calling as husbands, as fathers, as men. Tim Keller, I think, helps us understand how wonderful it is to have the example of God as our own fatherhood when he says this, quote, the only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that same access to our heavenly father. And men... We are called to provide that same access to our children, to our grandchildren. Glory to God for that. We have a high calling. Number two, number two, we live in a challenging time to exercise that calling. Can I get a witness? We live in a challenging time. So here in Mark chapter 9, what a challenging situation that the scene around that dad and his boy, is, it's a raw scene, isn't it? It's chaotic. The crowd is there, and the crowd is growing, and it's clearly agitated. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew that the scribes are also there, and they're off to the side arguing with the disciples. The disciples are confused because clearly in the past, they'd been able to do something with this demon, but clearly they couldn't do it there. The boy is sick. I mean, the boy is not just sick. Look at what it says there. He's foaming at the mouth. He's convulsing. I mean, that was a traumatic situation for everybody. Did you see as well that the enemy was there? The enemy was there. I think it's important for us to understand that if we're husbands and wives, you're right, God is definitely in our relationship and we're in our relationship. 
But guess what? There's also an enemy there. Now, we're more powerful than the enemy, but he's there, right? And he's going to do everything he can to bring us down. The dad here is desperate. He's desperate. He's even a little accusatory. Even Jesus, and the way he responds, seems a little agitated, doesn't he? And yet, I want you to think about this. Is this not a picture of the atmosphere in which we find ourselves today? I mean, people are stretched like never before. Right? Evil abounds in our world. Today, we're arguing about the role of men and women. Today, in our society, marriage is being redefined, right? We're confused about gender, right? Children are clearly struggling with anxiety, with depression, and other... I mean, I don't know about you, but to me, at least, it's a time unlike any I've ever seen in my life. And you know what I think as well? I think it's actually harder for men to be men and to find their way than in any other time in history. Men are confused about their role in society. They're confused about their role in marriage. They're confused about their role in the home. And sadly, right, you can find a whole lot more versions of toxic masculinity out there than you can find anything else. Plus, when was the last time you saw a father or a husband in a sitcom not portrayed as a bumbling goofball? I mean, it's, that's the way it is. And make no mistake, there's an enemy behind this. Right? Jesus said this. He said we have an enemy. In fact, he said the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And so I, I know that this is a, a hard truth to hear this morning, but you and I have to understand, I think, that we have an enemy in our lives and he stands against everything that our Father has for us. And he's wreaked havoc in our world through pornography and sexual immorality, and through a pandemic and through politics and through online discourse and sex trafficking and the internet and technology and just all the stuff that's out there today, leading many of us astray. He attacks marriages. He attacks children, your children, my children. He attacks my grandchildren and our role as men, our role as women, our role as husbands and wives and parents. He's going after all of that stuff. And I think today, just like in this story, he wants to destroy the families, the children that God has given to us. And by the grace of God, we have a part in not letting that happen. And so number one, you and I have an amazing, man, we have a high calling. I don't care what the world says. I don't care how many sitcoms are out there that make us look like nitwits. We have a high calling as men, a holy calling. And we're living in a challenging time. Thirdly, you say, where's the hope? Here we go. I think there's hope for us and the calling that God has given to us. If you go with me for a moment to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, I think the Bible teaches us here in just one of many places that there is hope for us to live out our calling. Listen to what Psalm 78 says. The Bible says here, my Bible says that it is a mass kill of Asaph. A mass kill is a writing where you mourn something, but then you also have hope. And that's what he's talking about here. He's going he's gonna to mourn how difficult it is, you know, to raise children, but then he's going to give us hope. And listen to what he says here in the opening words. Psalm 78, verse 1. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders that he's done. Hey, listen, if you're looking for a mission statement as a, as a, as a grand uh, a parent or even as, as a parent, look no farther than this passage. He goes on to say in verse 6, so the next generation will know the word of God, even the children yet to be born. 
and they in turn will tell their children, then they can put their trust in God and not forget his deeds. There it is, church family. That's our job, fatherhood and motherhood. It is, it is huge, huge in the lives of people and our children, helping them understand their personal and faith identity. The Bible gives a lot of great examples of what he's talking about right here. I got a couple on the screen right here this morning. Uh, wise fathers, wise parents, but especially fathers. Number one, wise fathers are careful to not exasperate their kids. Ephesians 6 and verse 4 says, fathers, don't, don't exasperate your children. Secondly, wise fathers, we are called to lead our family a through life with a stable spiritual commitment. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6, an amazing passage of Scripture. Thirdly, we're called to look into the future and function as what I want to call today a provisionary, part of what we provide, we protect. We look out into the future for our, for our kids and for our families. And then the Bible says we do this all in an understanding that we have a father who loves us. By the grace of God, we're called to take care of business this way. You know, I remember once, a uh, number of years ago, I don't often tell this story in public, but uh, when my daughter was in college, she was going to be uh, going to Italy for a semester, and so uh, we had to uh, go to the Italian consulate. We were living in Massachusetts at that time. We had to go to the Italian consulate in Boston to uh, get her papers together. We got there very early in the morning. We drove two hours to get there. And uh, we waited all day long. And finally, it was like 10 of 5 at night, and we were the next people in line. And the guy behind the, kind, the, the counter, who was a, a royal pain that day, trust me, uh, he comes out and he says, go on home. We're not seeing anybody else today. Well, like I said, uh, we had driven two hours downtown Boston. It takes the Holy Spirit to really help you do that. <laughs> and I was having none of it that day. And I won't tell you exactly what I said and what I did, but I raised some cane in that office, so much so that the guy in the back office heard what was going on, and he was in charge and he, came, he comes up, and I told him, you know, hey, this guy's been treating people terrible all day long. I wanted to say, I know we're in the Italian consulate, but this is America, bro. I don't talk to people like that. But anyway, the guy says, okay. Clearly, it had been a problem before. He takes my daughter and me to the back of the, of, uh, of the consulate, and the, 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 the papers are right on his desk. And... Uh, Needless to say, we got, we got those papers. And today, of course, my kids joke about it. My, da my daughter says, you know, don't get dad mad. He's going to go all Italian consulate on us here. <laughs> now, I don't want to sound prideful when I say this, but, you know, that was a day I think my daughter learned that her daddy wasn't afraid to take care of business for her. And, you know, dads, I think that's some of what we have to do sometimes. Take care of business and, and live in such a way that we protect and we provide for our family. And so, you know, how do we do this? How do we do this? I just want to say today that when it comes to being a father, you know, I, I don't have it all wired. I've made my share of mistakes. And so uh, for the next couple of moments here, I want to have us think about this. How do I live out good fathering? Like even if I've had a bad example, some of you might be thinking, you know, I didn't have a good example. Right? So my, my dad wasn't really engaged the way, you know, I had to, you know, wait later on to hear and learn a bunch of things. So, so what are some things we can talk about here today for just, for just a few minutes to, to help us? And I, and I say this, I say these next few things not to beat anybody over the head, but to just encourage us as dads and as granddads uh, 
in, in, some, in what I think are some good things. Here we go. Number one, love your family enough to boldly claim them for the Lord. Like, have you ever done that? So way back in the, near the beginning of the Bible, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, Joshua said this. He said, you know, I don't, I don't really care what the rest of you guys are going to be doing, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Have you ever done that? Have you ever, like, just prayed that? I think that's what what this dad was doing here in Mark chapter 9, right? He was saying, not today, Satan, not today. You're not going to have my son anymore. And I just want to say, you know what? Dads, we're not always going to get it right. In fact, we might get it wrong more than we get it right. I feel like that's how it was with me. And I think as dads, we're, we're, we're awful hard on ourselves as well. But if you do this one thing right, if you and I, if we love our wives and if we love our children enough that we are going to boldly claim them for Jesus Christ, I think that love will cover a multitude of mistakes that we'll make. Boldly claim them for Jesus. Number two, bring your family to the Lord in prayer. Bring your family to God in prayer. Pray for your family. Way back in the Bible, in Job chapter 1, we have, I think, an amazing example there. The Bible says this about Job. It says, early in the morning, he would sacrifice a a burnt offering. So he was kind of like me, I guess, there, huh? Yeah. (laughs) Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of his children, thinking... Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Wow. I have to confess, when I was a busy young dad involved in my career and all that stuff, I didn't pray for my family the way I should have. I didn't. But I can tell you this, that's all, that's all that has changed. And one of the things I've learned is that the most important thing that I do every single day of my life is I bring my wife and I bring my children and I bring my grandchildren and I bring my brother's children to the Lord because I know that they have an enemy. And you know what? If I feel the enemy is going after one of my children or one of my grandchildren in a special way, I will spend more focused prayer for them on my knees so that God will have his way in their lives. Dads, listen to me this morning, dads. Moms, grandpas, grandmas, this is the most powerful thing I think we do for our kids. Bring them to the Lord. Bring them to the Lord. Pray for them. And while you're, while you're there, just admit how much you need God. Number three, be your, be your wife's biggest fan. Listen to me. Does your wife know that you are her biggest fan? Does she? Colossians 3.19, amazing passage of scripture says, basically says this, don't be harsh with your wife. Listen to me. Being your wife's biggest fan is a job only you can do. You don't want anybody else doing it. Trust me. We live in a world full of critics. You don't have to go very far to find someone who will put put you down. Your wife doesn't have very far to go to find somebody who will put her down. Just like be that person. Like I know you're not always going to agree with her, right? Right? If you agree on everything, then one of you isn't necessary. That's what I often say. (laughs) And there are going to be times when she annoys you. By the way, newsflash, you annoy her. (laughs) But be that person in your wife's life who always builds her up. Number four, bring your kids to church. How important is it that your kids connect with a local church? Bring your kids to church. 
Look at this. Look at this, these statistics. 72% of kids will grow up to attend church if both mom and dad attend regularly. That's huge. And by regularly, I don't mean one out of four, FYI. Next, 15% of kids will, own, will, will attend church if only mom attends. 55% will be involved in church if only dad attends. See how that jumps? Dads! Wow. Only 6% of kids will attend church if neither parent does. And so I know there's a stereotype, right? Well, all of us have been raised, I think, with this stereotype that, that women are the ones who do the spiritual stuff. Can we, like, break that today? Church, a real man, a real man leads his family spiritually and doesn't say, you know what, sweetheart, this is your job. No, it's, it's your job. It's your job. You are the leader. You are the provisionary. Bring your family to church. Letter E, bless your kids through the gift of time. You know, here's one of the things I learned. I learned that my kids spell time, excuse me, they spell love, T-I-M-E. My grandkids, they spell love, T-I-M-E. I'm getting ready to go out to, uh, to uh, Los Angeles this week, and I'm going to bring some money out with me because I'm going to want to spend like a drunken sailor when I'm out there <laughs> on my grandkids. But you know what? They don't really care about the money I'm going to give them. You know what happens when I get there? Grandpa, give me some money. No. <laughs> Grandpa, play with me. Grandpa, are we going to shoot basketball? We're already talking about it. Wow, that's huge. I have some regrets here. I'm going to be honest. I was an involved dad. I think I was a pretty good dad. But, you know, my career, my ministry uh, was such that it was 24-7, right? So there were so many times when I was present physically, but I wasn't present emotionally and I wasn't present mentally. My wife was amazing that way, but I wasn't. And I wish I could do a do-over there. Like sometimes... I would come home from work and my son, my son would have a baseball bat and gloves waiting at the garage and I knew what that meant. And many times we went and played ball, but there are a lot of times when I, I thought I had more important things to do. Dads, learn from that, will you? I learned from that. That's a regret I have. Bless your kids through the gift of time. Letter F, guide your children through life. I apologize for that. Guide your children through life. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not turn from it. Here's one of the most important things that Karen and I learned. We learned that we should get out of our kids' faces and into their hearts. We learned from Josh McDowell that rules without relationship equals rebellion. But rules with a relationship equals respect and renewal. And here's, here's the thing that, that I'm learning I'm learning that sometimes my kids need me just as much today as they did when they were 12. And so that's why I say, guide your children through life. And it, by the way, when they get into their 20s and 30s and they have their own kids, it's amazing how much smarter you're going to become. <laughs> right? And we became like brilliant overnight. <laughs> and so just be present. Be present. Mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. And then letter G, don't be afraid to admit when you've been wrong. 
Recently, I was listening to a podcast about preaching. Some of you are thinking, man, that sounds like watching paint dry, right? <laughs> but it's interesting to me because it's my life work. Anyway, and on this po- podcast, the guy was talking about how it's hard to preach good sermons week after week after week. And you, you, it's a challenge, and, and especially the weekends that you preach, the enemy attacks you in ways that he doesn't otherwise. Like when you're getting up to handle the word of God, Satan knows how important the word of God is. And so he, gets at, he goes after you. And it just caused me to just to think about, you know, all those years when I was raising kids. And I was preaching all the time then. And a lot of times when my wife would say on a Friday night, oh, I can see, I can see your game face. You know, it would just come over me, and I'd start feeling the stress of preaching in front of a lot of people. And, and it just dawned on me how that had to, af- had to affect my wife and my kids down through the years. So I reached out to all of them one day by a text, and I expressed this. I just apologized for how my ministry and how... I handled some of those things might have affected them personally. And their response was so gracious. Wow. And I'll keep that text conversation forever. I know I gave my kids a gift, you know, without apology, because I've known a lot of people down through the years who have lived with what I want to call an open father wound. They've had dads. They've had a dad who made some mistakes, but but the dad never circled back and tried to make it right. And maybe you are one of those people. Maybe your dad made some, maybe your dad really hurt you and and he never came back and made it right. If so, that definitely colors how you think of God. And I think if, if that's who you are today, I, I, have, I just want to encourage you to do two things. Number one, I think you need to acknowledge that that was not okay. It was not right for your father to hurt you, nor was it right for him to not come back and to make that right. And then secondly, I think you need to determine that you're not going to let it dictate the rest of your life and how you raise your children. Now, I understand that some of us may need some help here because, you know, uh, continuing to let uh, that hurt hurt us, what it does is it hurts our families then. It hurts the people who are under us. And what it's doing, I think, is it's also continuing what I want to call a generational sin. And so you might need some help here, and we're here to help you. We'll do our best to come alongside of you because, honestly... We're just all trying to figure this out ourselves, including this pastor. And so if you've messed up, go back and tell them. They already know, by the way. Just say, hey, I wish I would have done that better. Would you forgive me? If your kids are like my kids, wow, it'll actually do your heart good to hear them tease you about it and, and be gracious. I close this morning by reminding us that one of, the, one of my favorite stories, I think, in the Bible is the story of the prodigal son. And I love this painting here of the prodigal coming back home, Luke chapter 15. He decided that he had had enough of his family, right? And he was going to go out do his own thing, and he went out and partied and indulged in all kinds of riotous living, the Bible says, and it was fun for a while, but like for many of us, it eventually broke him, and he came to the end of himself, and he, and he came back home. And while he came trudging up that lane, I can just see it, can't you? The Bible says that that father wasn't waiting there for him like this, you know, saying, I knew you'd eventually come back. You didn't know how good you had it here, did you? No, the Bible says that while his son was a long 
long way off. He ran to him and he hugged him and he kissed him and he welcomed him back home. And he said, we're going to have a party. To me, it's one of the most beautiful, beautiful stories in the Bible. And I've always believed that that prodigal son made the decision to come back home in part because he knew his father's heart. He knew his father's heart. Dads, you know, we're going to make mistakes. But when they know our hearts, when we let them see our hearts, when we let them see our father's heart, I think we really help them become everything that God wants them to become. You be that dad. You be that granddad. Have that same heart to your kids. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's stand together this morning, shall we? Lord, we just, we, we come, we humble ourselves before you today. We know that you've called us, you've given us a high, a holy calling, an amazing calling. You care about it. And it's not easy. But it's without a doubt possible. Because you are in us. You are in us. And so, Lord Jesus, be powerfully present today in every mom and dad, in every husband and wife, every person in this room today. Be powerfully present in us, Lord. Give us the grace to live out this amazing calling. Help us to ask for help when we need it. to never stop asking you for help. We thank you and we praise you for that. In your great name, we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to Church of the Open Door Sermons Podcast. Church of the Open Door is based out of York, Pennsylvania, and we exist to help everyone discover life changed through Jesus. For more information about Church of the Open Door or for locations and service times, be sure to visit us at codyork.org. Thanks again so much for listening.